Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or even perhaps good evening. Welcome to our webinar today, Journey to the Cloud, Accelerate Data-Driven Decisions. We're so happy that you've all taken time out from your day to spend a little bit of it with us. And we have a really exciting webinar planned for you. So I would love to make you all as our audience a part of this, and we are welcoming questions from you. So you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, there's a Q&A. Please at any time, feel free to put your questions in there. We'd love to hear from you. We'll probably hold most of them towards the end, um, but please feel free to jot them down and put them into the Q&A section at any time. We'd love your participation. So let's get started with our first slide. We have an exciting agenda today, and we're going to start by introducing some amazing guests that we have joining us. Then we're going to have a case study. Then we'll ask the whole panel to join in for a discussion. And please feel free to be a part of that discussion by asking any questions you have of our panel. And we'll take some final audience questions towards the end. So that's what we have planned for you. We expect it to be really interactive, although we can't hear you today. Sadly, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. So again, feel free to add your questions to the Q&A or into the chat, and we'll be looking for those and happy to answer those as we go along. I want to get started by introducing myself and our panel. Um, and I am... Uh, a marketer of a long time in technology. And I started my career at Apple Computer in the early, early 80s. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Steve Jobs and the rest of the crew there in a company that was under 300 people and have gone on to have marketing leadership roles at many companies, uh, including Adobe and Cisco and many others, been at a few startups as well. So that's my background, and I'm so happy to be here as your host today for Grid Dynamics, who is sponsoring this webinar. And I'm going to ask Dimitri to introduce himself. Yeah, thank you. It was a fantastic introduction. So for me, uh, I'm heading data practice at Grid Dynamics. I help uh, our customers to build robust and scalable data and ML platforms, help to ship to the production. And um, this is my actually primary responsibility along with discipline development. So that's it. And I'm passing to Kritika. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Kritika Ganesamurthy. I'm the global partner tech lead at Amazon Web Services. So what I do in my role is I work with both technology and consulting partners, partners like Grid Dynamics, and help them with the solution enablement and also with go-to-market. Excited to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Litvak. I am the Director of Data and Analytics for our electronics manufacturing segment at Jabil. I'm responsible and my teams are responsible for building business intelligence and advanced analytics solutions for our business partners. In addition to that, we are responsible for data governance activities and the development of a data platform, which I'll be speaking more about in depth today. Fantastic. Well, welcome to our panelists. And we're really so honored to have you all join us today. And we'll have an interesting discussion, I'm sure. Um, to kick off today, though, I'd like to hear from all of you who've joined us. So everybody who's taken time out, it would be really helpful to understand a little bit about you. That way we can really tailor our comments to you and do a better job to make this more enjoyable. So the first poll should be showing on your screen. And here we want you to choose the one best answer that suits where you're at in terms of thinking about your journey to use the cloud to accelerate data-driven decisions. So choose one of these, and then we'll all look at the results in just a minute. All right, can we bring up the results? Okay, so here's what we're looking at. This is pretty interesting. We've got a lot of you out here who are joining because you're starting to think about, and I do think this is gonna be a great place to get some really valuable information before you start work. And then quite a number of you are, are well on your way on your journey. So looking for how do you really now take what you've built and expand it. So we've got kind of uh, bookends here and then fewer of you are in the middle. So that is super helpful. And we'll try to address both of those things, plus a couple of things in the middle for you outliers there. So thanks for taking that poll. We have one more poll that we want to have you weigh in on. 
And here it is. And this one, you can choose at all answers. I mean, if you, if you think all of these apply, choose them all. If you think only a few, click those. So to, in today's webinar, I'm hoping to learn and then choose all that apply. Okay, you, Alex, you wanna bring up the uh, answers so we can see, all right. Well, it looks like we have a pretty good uh, distribution here, but it looks like many of you wanna learn about the benefits of using cloud for data analytics. Um, logically, I think a number of you wanna learn how to get started because it sounds like a lot of you are at the beginning of the journey. A fewer on implementation and planning. Lessons learned sounds like a big one, but the biggest one and the big winner is what is the future looking like? Which uh, I have to agree with all of you. I think that is incredibly exciting to think about what is coming. And I know there's a lot of exciting things coming we can tell you about today. And then the last one is um, what is the technology and the processes that are required to make the transition? So uh, it sounds like with the exception of the planning and implementation, uh, we've got pretty good interest across the board on the other. So that's great. That's really helpful. Thank you guys for telling us. And our panelists and myself will do our very best job to try and address these things that you're most interested in. And I think that today um, our kickoff speaker Ryan Litvak is going to probably cover just about all of these in his talk. And I think you're going to learn a lot of things. And by the way, if you don't know Jable, they're an amazing company. He'll probably tell a little bit about it. I've had experiences working with them that are great. And uh, if you ever need help with manufacturing and manufacturing expertise, they are the ones to go to. Uh, they have been in this valley for so, so many years and done so many great things with so many companies I've worked with. So Ryan, I want to introduce you and turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, June. I appreciate that. So I uh, wanted to start off by just giving a little overview of what we do at Jable and who we are. Uh, Jable was founded in 1966 and we're one of the largest contract manufacturers in the world today, building many of the products that you use, likely on a daily basis, and distributed across dozens of sites uh, in dozens of countries worldwide. We have over 50 million square feet of manufacturing space, and we're developing these products, and all of those products are churning out terabytes and petabytes of information. So as a company, we're not new to leveraging data in order to optimize our operations. But what I'm gonna talk about today is our journey of moving from a very legacy on-premise infrastructure towards a cloud-based infrastructure and the benefits that we've gotten from that. So next slide, please. So this is our long-term goal. This is where we're trying to head is the, the idea of intelligent manufacturing. And what we're doing today across more than a hundred sites is leveraging all of the machines that we have that are building the products that we're manufacturing and trying to connect all of those machines, get the data from them, pull it somewhere to where we can evaluate the parametric data that's coming from those machines as we're building millions of products every month. And what we're looking to do with that is to create real-time validations and alerting, improve yields We've been on this journey for a number of years from a business intelligence standpoint, trying to get a better sense from descriptive and diagnostic analytics of where are we? Where are we with our manufacturing processes? Are we in control? Can we identify when issues occur, where those issues happened, why they happened? And that's really the, the, the point that we've gotten to at this point. Where we're looking to go and we're just dipping our toes in the water at this point is getting into the more of the advanced analytics space, being able to leverage AI and ML. We want to collect the collective intelligence of a lot of our operators who perform the analysis when something goes wrong, to be able to pull that into the system, try to then evaluate that information and see if we can predict when things are going to go wrong before they go wrong so we can start to be more proactive about addressing those types of issues. Once we're doing, once we're able to do that, the long-term goal is to be more proactive. So from a correction standpoint, one example of that would be uh, to proactively modify the machine settings to be more optimal for the future. So there, 
the two biggest things that we're going after from a uh, transformation standpoint would be the time it takes to transform incoming raw materials into finished goods, the transformation time, and one of the biggest contributors to that is changeover time. So if we can change the settings proactively without requiring operator intervention, that's a significant savings. And the second one is scrap. So if we can identify quality issues before they occur, before they, they render a board uh, unusable, then we're able to save a lot of costs and be a lot more effective. So in, in the course of evaluating how we could move from our current state to a, a better future state, we've identified several common challenges across a number of domains. It's not just operations. We, we have these challenges interacting, whether it's with finance, supply chain, or other groups, is information fragmentation. So we have multiple silos, and within each silo, that group has created a locally optimal solution for their use cases. However, as we're trying to evolve to to the future state for analytics, we need to pull data from multiple silos together to gain insights that we couldn't get before. But none of those systems were built with that in mind. They were built to be entirely self-contained closed systems to deliver the requirements that that particular domain needed. So that's been uh, definitely a friction point up until this point. Uh, the second identified challenge was just a lack of understanding. So even as we're getting data from different systems and machine data is a good example of this, there's additional information that we need to combine with that data to provide the contextual understanding of, of what, that, uh, what that data actually means. So when we're getting machine data, we need to bring in failure labels and additional contextual metadata about the machine data before we're able to really drive any value from it. And then third is global inconsistency. So we have oftentimes not just one system that manages a particular process in any one particular domain. There could be multiple systems. It could be Excel spreadsheets. It could be uh, an off-the-shelf solution. It could be something homegrown. So there's not a lot of consistency in the structure of the data, and that makes it very difficult to bring it together across multiple sites in particular. So we find a lot of site-specific solutions that then are not able to be scaled beyond that one site because of the, the inconsistency of the domain. So we've been on this journey now for about one year. Uh, approximately one year ago, we partnered with Grid Dynamics to do an analysis of our data landscape and to provide a proposal of how we could move in, into the next step. And uh, we've been working towards that. And I just want to present a few of the lessons we've learned up to this point. So this is where we are today. And one of the big lessons learned through all of this is, is to avoid the Big Bang. So this architecture is similar in concept, but not exactly what we were envisioning from the very start. And that's because we really drove this from a use case standpoint of where we could get value from the implementation. So as I had mentioned before, we didn't have a central place where we could aggregate a lot of our machine data across sites. So a lot of that machine data has been trapped in file folders at individual sites and trying to bring it all together is quite a difficult challenge. So that was one of the original use cases that drove some of the value from this platform. We've then layered on additional use cases, specific customer requirements around data retention, where we're able to segment and move data into specific areas for that customer. Uh, we have additional ESPC statistical uh, applications that look at the quality of the, the manufacturing processes that we're then now able to feed some of that process and curated machine data to them. And there are some additional reporting requirements where we're now able to get a level of traceability reporting that we didn't have before. So we've been layering each of these use cases one at a time uh, into this and evolving the architecture. So following on that, you know, one of the biggest takeaways is to be to follow that incremental modernization approach, but you want to follow a North Star. So you want to have an idea of where you want to end up. And where we started was that we have a legacy platform that was very monolithic. 
It was slow and difficult to change. It was quite complex because it's grown organically over the past 15 to 20 years. And it was replicated across a number of, of sites in order to be able to provide the level of uh, SLA requirements that we have on a site-by-site -site basis. So we wanna be able to provide to our sites and to our business partners a level of reporting and advanced analytics that they weren't able to have before. And through this partnership, we were looking at what value could we get from migrating pieces of this at a time into a more modern platform. And that modern platform really is cloud-based. It's much more lightweight and modular. It's allowed us to incrementally bring pieces of that architecture into being so that we didn't have to start with a large platform, a large footprint right from the start that was very expensive and difficult to show ROI from. Uh, the infrastructure as code really has allowed us to have a, a level of standardization and we're now able to share the, uh, the platform as we've built it with our other uh, partners, our other segments within Jabil. And it's flexible. We've been able to make changes very dynamically through this process to respond to the needs and requirements of our business partners. And one of the biggest long-term benefits that we see is the ROI through scale. So we have, as I said before, uh, over 100 sites. We were operating uh, 15 to 20 different data marts that were globally distributed. And there was a lot of duplication from the site level and then from that intermediate level before we got to our global data warehouse, where we're now able to combine a lot of that infrastructure and not duplicate the hardware capital investment. So data governance is, is often one of those things that uh, comes into being towards the end of these projects. But what we've learned is that it's it's important to consider that and factor it in much earlier in, in the project. And it has been something that we've taken a much leaner approach to than we have in the past. Traditionally at Jabil, uh, we've tried a, a very heavy approach to data governance in the past where we didn't get a lot of buy-in. It was uh, very centralized, complex, uh, focused on risk mitigation. With this platform that we've been putting in place, we've been able to automate a lot of the activities, a lot of the monitoring and notifications and visibility so that we're able to take a much more collaborative approach to be able to engage the different domain owners uh, of the data so that they can own their own data and treat it more as a product rather than just an asset that they're consuming. And we've been able to be a lot more responsive and focused on value creation. So this is taken the form of uh, change management processes that we've been implementing. And through that platform, we're able to identify the, the right ownership and be able to segment the data so that they can own their, their own data. Uh, an, another big thing to take away from this is to have the right skills. So I come from a technology background of building transactional systems. And uh, I've come into this with a uh, several years now of analyzing our data landscape, but looking at this, it, it's definitely its own domain. So you can come in and, and look at what you build on top of your data infrastructure, how you visualize it, how you extract the data and portray the, the insights back to your, your consumers. And that takes a much more of an application solution development background. But underlying all of that, there's a lot of different skills. So whether you're talking about data lakes or data warehouses, those are all very specific technology skills and you need the right expertise right, right at the start. It's not something that you want to evolve into uh, without having the right technology skills. So data architecture and cloud architecture are their own disciplines and the skills are not necessarily transferable. So I would definitely avoid having um, you know, this be something that you evolve with uh, resources if you don't have the right expertise. So from a benefit standpoint, uh, from our operations, we're looking at significant cost savings over the next several years. 
And a lot of that is driven through the improved cost transparency that we have right now. So we buy a lot of hardware on premise and once the capital expenditure has been made, a lot of the costs are hidden. So there's an assumption that it's just free or that those costs are absorbed somewhere else. And so there's not a lot of visibility to it. But through the implementation in the cloud, we've now been able to make those costs a lot more transparent and we can provide a full total cost of ownership for this platform, for what an implementation looks like. And we can communicate that to our business partners when we're having specific requirements around data retention. Uh, and some of the, the data retention requirements that we have can be significant up, upwards of 20 to 25 years of data that customers are asking us to store. We didn't have a good way of communicating what that internalized cost was. And now we're able to have conversations with our customers around bearing the cost of the requirements that they're putting back on us for managing some of the data. From a development standpoint, we're now able to leverage data across sites, not just trapped within one site, uh, to be able to develop analytics that can span multiple sites and can give you an entire view of a region or even globally. Additionally, we're able to operationalize the AI ML models that we're starting to build. So it's not sufficient to just create a POC of an AI ML model. You need a, a, the ability to deploy it into production, to manage, to monitor it, to retrain it with new data and then be able to redeploy it. So that's where we're really looking to head with this. And as we're building the data products into the platform and making them available, it's helping enable a lot of our site-based development to develop reports and reporting capabilities a lot faster. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the very early wins that we got from this was a, a level of traceability reporting that we didn't have before. So this was, uh, we now have full traceability end-to-end -end for a material that's being developed, for a product that's being developed all the way through each of the, the processes with, where the machines are connected to the data platform. From an infrastructure standpoint, we had a, a as I mentioned, a very large legacy footprint of our infrastructure that oftentimes was built very organically. It, in one region, it could be implemented in one manner, in another region, it could be implemented in a completely different way. And there wasn't, there wasn't uh, a lot of standardization. And so you had to have the people in that region who had very specific tribal knowledge of how to manage and monitor those uh, resources, that solution in that region that wasn't necessarily fully transferable to manage and monitor a solution for another region. So it was very difficult. There was a lot of inconsistency across that and we're driving a lot more consistency and an ability to ensure that the infrastructure that we're deploying in one region is very similar to the infrastructure that we're deploying in another region. And that is all I have for today. So I'm very interested if anybody has any questions. Great, Ryan, thank you so much. That was so interesting. And I loved hearing all the benefits, not only that, that you got with your team, but all the people in all the various areas where this was being implemented. This it sounds like a really exciting project with great benefits, but also a huge amount of work. And I'm just wondering, how did you kick this thing off internally? Did you, did you have to do selling and getting your management team to buy in and all the teams that were in the remote locations that were going to have to be a part of this? How did that work? So uh, as I had mentioned, I was previously responsible for a lot of our transactional systems and data has always been one of our biggest challenges. It's from a reporting standpoint, historically we did a lot of reporting out of our transactional systems, which was not an optimal solution and was very difficult for our site-based resources who were interested in getting more and more information from those systems. And so this has been the culmination of a lot of identifying problems, identifying and communicating why implementing some of the solutions that they're asking for was difficult, and eventually showing the value of 
if we could pull this together into a common location, if we had a way of extracting, modeling, governing this data, then we would be able to provide that and enable our site resources more of a self-service ability. And it's it's really become, uh, it's coming at the right time where the business is recognizing the value of their data to be able to take the next step for the business. So it's really come together at the right time and the, the technology has reached a point of maturity where we're now able to quickly turn around some of the benefits and show the ROI that we're promising in that sales engagement. So do you feel like what you what you discussed at the beginning of the project, the the expectations people had, is is the actual implementation living up to those? Uh, it, it definitely is. So we started this without a, a concrete use case initially, and we started to build leveraging some of the accelerators that were available. Uh, several months after that, one or two months, we had some critical projects that had the need for a central location to put the, all of the machine data. And so we quickly went from a side project to a critical component of a top level project. And it's it's allowed us to meet the the timelines that were required because otherwise we'd be building a completely separate solution for managing and maintaining this data in a way that wouldn't have been as scalable. Yeah, well, that sounds like you had a little luck on your side, but it's great that your your organization has realized the value of that data, and I think that's one of the big hidden treasures in almost every company I've worked with. That, that they're underusing their data and underusing it because it's been so difficult to get to it and like with your problem to aggregate it. Exactly. And I, and I think that that's been one of the biggest thing that's helped push us forward is just the visibility of coming from a critical use case. And now we're getting the data into the platform. We're not having to hunt and ask people to send data to it. Now people are saying, well, if you've got machine data there and I want to get this other report that requires data from another system. How do we get that other system's data in here? And so now you're starting to get that, that critical point of you know, critical mass of pulling enough data in that people can actually go to the system and get value from it. No, oh, that's exciting. That's gotta be really, uh, really wonderful for everybody working there to be able to get access to that information. Um, yeah. One of the thing you, you mentioned that I'm really curious about is you talked about people needing the right skills and that those skills are very specific and difficult to, you know, learn. So how did you, how did you handle that? Did you have the people to do it? Did you have to hire people? Did you use other outside resources? How did that work for you? Several years ago, we had done an inventory of the skills that we, we have in abundance, and then what skills we were looking at for the future that we considered transformational. And so we were comparing transformational skills versus run and maintain skills against what we have in abundance and what we have that are scarce. And what we really determined was from a transformational skill standpoint, we really didn't have an abundance in any of the skills. And so it was a combination of upskilling, creating a, a training path, figuring out which run and maintain skills, like we have a lot of DBAs, but there's a career, there's a an upskilling path to become a data engineer. Uh, we have a lot of uh, people who are familiar with modeling and interacting with data from a BI perspective, but we don't have a lot of data scientists. So how do we upskill people there? And then how do we form the right partnerships with companies that have the right skills and experience in this area to be able to help accelerate our move into that space while we're upskilling and bringing in the right, the, the people with the right skills? That's really interesting and, and, and really helpful. And I think based on what our audience said in the beginning about wanting to know about the future, I think part of the future is having the right people to realize it. And so I think having that, that plan together was, was really smart on your, your behalf. And you kind of do because these technologies, some of them can be very specific and require these specific skills and knowledge. So that's great. Well, let me, let me open this up to the rest of the panel here. Welcome to you guys. Glad to have you join. And um, I want to ask, Dimitri, I want to start with you and I ask you kind of a two-part question, which is, you know, Ryan had a specific use case that was around manufacturing and remote data. And to a certain extent, probably most companies have some remote data, but 
what other use cases um, might this migration to the cloud um, cover? And um, what would be the benefits of those? Maybe you can help me out with that one. Yeah, uh, thank you, June. Uh, so typically, uh, migration to the cloud helps the company to discover new capabilities uh, uh, that they have now um, on top of the cloud platform. And that means that um, a company can easily scale the platform, uh, can connect uh, various uh, ML platforms to the data that they have onboarded, run um, data science experiments easily, uh, play with the data, uh, build flexible reporting system. So uh, migration to the cloud helps companies to, um, uh, to discover new capabilities, uh, which in on-prem systems may be really hard to introduce. Um, so that's, uh, I would say, just a starting point how companies, um, uh, a starting point when they reach to the cloud, uh, they start playing with the data, start uh, discovering new uh, opportunities and uh, change their mindset to be more flexible and to be able to build uh, their solutions more in data mesh manner. Okay, interesting. Well, thanks for that. Um, let me turn back to Ryan for one second here and ask you, Ryan, um, you know, you talked about self-service and about people that were in these uh, remote locations now being able to have easier access to the data. I'm wondering, um, were these people originally IT people? Have they been business people? Now can someone who is actually running the business have access to this data easily? Who, who was it actually getting access and how did that work? Yeah, so we have a number of people who work directly at our sites, much more on the business operations side, who do amazing things with Excel today and have done for a number of years. But oftentimes they jump through just incredible hoops to get that job done. And so what we're trying to do and what we've started to be able to do is to pull the data and describe it and make it available in a way that makes their job easier. So. There's a number of reports that uh, come to IT right now, but could very easily be accomp accomplished if we could make that data more self-service. So we're really looking at driving this all the way down to the business, you know, the operations users who are trying to leverage the data on a daily basis to improve and optimize the work that they're doing. Okay, that's that's interesting. I mean, I know for myself as a business owner, that would be that would be amazing <laughs> if people could do that for me. So I think that's a really exciting capability. Um, Krithika, we haven't heard from you yet, and I have a question for you. Um, and I know this is really relevant to our audience because they told us, and that is, you know, once you get get up and running in the cloud, and you know, maybe you're at a place where Ryan is, and I think a number of people in our audience are there. What are the next steps? What are the things someone can look forward to? What could be the future for that company that's gotten to that place? Yeah, um, so I want to add a couple of things, like going back to what Ryan said, right? I mean, the, what fundamentally why they created the platform was to give that agility to the business owners to get access to the data. So when you start thinking about, okay, now, okay, we started off with one use case, as Ryan pointed out, that now you want to extend off to like different business units, different business groups, then we've we are actually starting to see customers gravitating towards a more like a domain oriented decentralization of the data. So what I mean by that is I'm going to take an analogy of what we see in software design, which is microservices. You know, we all know what microservices are, why we why that came into existence, right? Coming moving from a traditional monolith to a more nimble microservices space, where it's easy to scale, easy to launch new services. We see the same paradigm shift when it comes to data as well. People created this monolith data lake, data warehouses, but now they're like, you know what? Uh, this does not help us be get to the point where we want to, you know, giving business users the access 
to get to whatever data, data they want to, and also being able to ingest additional data sources. I know Dimitri alluded to the concept of data mesh earlier. That is exactly what it is. It's a very new fundamental, very new architectural paradigm, right? So what data mesh does is it says, let's just treat data as a service, more like, pro just like our product, right? Just data is, is a product, for instance, um, so if you have transaction data, if you have like metadata, like product reference data, so now you're trying to say, okay, which team actually owns the data and you decentralize the ownership of that to that particular team because they know the data best. So we know that when they expose that as a service, now it becomes easier for any other product teams or any other data teams to consume that as a service, just like a microservices concept. And then I just quickly wanted to just call out how it's done, right? So if you look at, okay, okay, great, sounds good, but how do we practically go about it? Um, it's fun. It's it's divided into like three groups. One, you have the producers. One, you have then you have the platform, the actual the, the foundation, the IT services, and then you have the consumers. I'm pretty sure the audience and most of you might be thinking, well, does it mean like I'm duplicating efforts? You know, people are just going to go rogue and start doing their own things. Not necessarily, right? Which is why we have the common, the data platform or the IT layer, which is to say in every company, you have an organization, you have an enterprise team, which says these are the common set of principles and platform and services that every producer or the consumer abide by. So that way you set some standards, you set some data governance in place, you, you sort of centralize that. But the actual production of the data and consumption of the data is decentralized. So that's how you bring more agility into your, into your business. And we see customers gravitating towards this data mesh sort of a concept more and more and moving away from the traditional monolith, the data lake and data warehouse. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And it, it totally makes sense to me. I really, I like that. That's super helpful. Do you, can you give us an example of a company you don't have to say the name of the company, but that's done something like that and maybe what they did and, and what the benefits yeah. were. So um, so we have companies moving into, and you know, there are companies in the CPG space who are looking into this data mesh concepts. If you look at CPGs, you know, they have their own wholesale business because they sell into retailers and the retailers give transaction data back, information back. So the CPGs can actually better tune, better forecast, better uh, produce new products and better position the products. Then they're also getting into more direct to consumer business, right? Which is directly selling to consumers. Um, so you call those, you know, there's a lot of digitally native brands, DNB. So the CPGs form like Dollar Shave Cloud that we all know, you know, one is one example of that. Um, so, so we see when CPG companies have these sort of different data from different organizations, a, a B2C team might not necessarily understand what, uh, how a wholesale operates. So we're, we're seeing um, CPG companies move towards this, uh, you know, the data mesh concept wherein they're saying, I'm going to decentralize ownership of the data. It's it, At some point for forecasting, you do want to understand how your direct-to-consumer channel works and how your wholesale channel works. But then again, th the team that owns the data, who understands the data, who cleanses, who augments, who makes the data available is going to be decentralized. So we see companies in retail and CPG moving towards that. Again, we don't have public references, sorry, I can't name the customer, but we've seen them because again, to, to the point being um, to democratize the data in a way that is easily accessible, people understand, right? If it's a huge organization, you have so much of data, just putting everything on one team to handle operations, management, you know, it's, it's just not scalable. Uh, so yeah, so we've seen companies um, navigating towards that. Okay, that's really interesting. Now you've been talking about really access to data and decentralizing access, but I'm also interested in how do you make the data more meaningful and intelligent? And Ryan talked how a, a bit about how, how uh, Jabil is doing that, but I'd love to hear your perspective working with many other companies on some things that our audience might want to think about in terms of how you set this up and how you get, how you get that valuable insight that you haven't been able to get otherwise. You know, the way when we talk to customers, you know, it's not just about creating a data lake, data warehouse and done, but then it's about saying, how do you actually bring all these services together, purpose built services, um, in a, enabling this unified, easy data movement, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's good. You have all the data in one place, but it's no good if nobody can access that. Um, so if you look at customers like Zillow or Airbnb or Slack, um, they're all getting into this, this, this sort of designing a platform wherein the, the data is just not bringing all the data from silos into one location, but actually making it actionable. And there's multiple ways you could do that, right? Give them, you know, like Ryan mentioned, self-service tools. 
And if you remember the architecture diagram that Ryan showed a little earlier, you could see the consumption layer in there and you saw services like Athena. So what services like Amazon Athena does is, you know, that is like a serverless query engine. So you have the data, you have the team centralizing the data in a data lake, but then you are also giving ability for your data scientists, your machine learning experts, even your business users who are savvy with SQL to be able to run SQL queries directly on the data that is in the data lake. So, I mean, that, and you get results back in seconds. So enabling such access, and then we also have Redshift, which is a data warehouse, which is a platform. And then what Redshift also does is, not only does it centralize the data just in one place, again, as I said earlier, when you enable a platform, you need to make sure there's data movement across the different services, right? It is not one, one particular database is not gonna solve all your use cases. We have purposeful databases and services to precisely help that. One particular database is very suited, a relational database is very suited for, you know, for, for data, which, which is very structured. That may not be applicable for an unstructured data. So we have those services in place to help customers precisely use the specific set of tools for the right use cases. Likewise, in, you know, we have another service called Redshift Spectrum. And what Redshift Spectrum does is, you know, if you look at the earlier slides from Ryan again, you could, you could see where he talked about some of the problems, which is one, one is explosion of all these unstructured data across you know, different platforms. And again, you want to be able to, as a business user, as a data scientist, have the ability to not just use your structured data or in, in the right schemas in your data warehouse, but having the ability to combine that with these unstructured data or semi-structured data in your data lakes. And that's why we have service like Redshift Spectrum which help users do that. So you don't have to map, move all the data into one database to be able to run queries. An example of that is like Dollar Shave Club. So Dollar Shave Club, uh, they use a combination of Athena, they use a combination of Redshift and Redshift Spectrum to query about like 60 terabytes of data across all of this. So enabling their business users, data, data scientists, an easy way to actually get insights from the data because you have, it's not just in one place, right? You can just get data from wherever it is, but then we have tools to help them do that. Yeah. Oh, it's great to have the tools. I mean, that really changes the game for people. You know, it's then it becomes more about just getting the tools in and having people learn how to use them versus having to build everything from scratch. And that's that's an onerous task. So I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Dimitri, let me let me go back to you for a minute here on a slightly different topic. But I'm interested, you know, Ryan hinted at some of this, but how in your mind do you think that Moving to the cloud for data analytics helps reduce infrastructure support efforts. And maybe you could give us an example of a company that has done that and how they were able to reduce their infrastructure support efforts. Uh, yeah, and uh, example here will uh, help to uh, understand the difference um, running applications on premise and running applications on cloud. Um, let's assume that uh, we have a distributed compute applications that are running, uh, let's say, on Apache Spark. Um, for that purpose, you're using Hadoop cluster on premise, and um, you need to manage this cluster. Uh, you need to manage um, any hardware issues, um, and also you need to manage uh, software updates. And these software updates, let's say uh, you would like to update uh, Hadoop version and you need to test before update. For testing purpose, you will need a separate cluster just to spin it up, test the, the latest version, ensure that your applications are running fine there, and then uh, create a plan to shift from uh, old version to new version. And um, we were involved in such kind of programs maybe five, five years ago. Uh, it was taking um, all the weekend long just to uh, prepare uh, before, um, ju just to migrate once all the environments are prepared. And before the preparation, company should order um, hardware to deploy a uh, new Hadoop and so on and so forth. So it was um, really a many step process uh, where somebody would like to upgrade um, software in their cluster. 
it was a kind of disaster sometimes when we needed to do a rollback if we have identified any blocker issues with new version. Uh, running it in the cloud makes it super easy. Uh, you just spin up a cluster with needed versions of your libraries. Uh, you test your application there. If you find any issues, uh, you can fix it and just repeat one more time. So it um, drastically reduces a lot of steps uh, which you need to prepare, um, plan, uh, then run it, um, scale if needed, and so on. And also one more point that uh, was really, really painful on premise. If you are updating um, a version of Hadoop and you would like to create a separate cluster and migrate everything from old to new and also upgrade hardware as well. Uh, you need to copy all the data from one old cluster to another new cluster. And it was a kind of uh, really hard thing uh, if you have terabytes of data. Now in the cloud, when you have separated your storage, compute, um, you don't even need uh, to copy the data if you just uh, changing one cluster to another cluster. So uh, these are just a couple of examples how a migration to the cloud helps to reduce uh, uh, amount of infrastructure operations and how uh, all infrastructure management um, starts to be easy and starts to be following infrastructure as a service uh, paradigm, uh, like Ryan has mentioned um, in his speech. Great. Well, that was really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I want to say something if yeah, I can. Go ahead. Please. Yeah, so as Dimitri mentioned, right, the speed and agility is something that, you know, we see customers having. And, and I think the customers are starting to realize that, you know, they don't have to work on undifferentiating things anymore. They can have their IT staff focus on differentiating factors for their business. But I think that is key, which is why customers are migrating towards this infrastructure as a service paradigm. And there's also like statistics from IDC. They've done a research to show that when enterprises move to the infrastructure as a service paradigm on AWS, they've actually seen infrastructure staff productivity go up by 62%. And also the application development productivity go by 25% because now they're not working on the undifferentiated factors, but working on the differentiating factors for the business. Yeah, so. that's cool. That's a great point. Thanks for adding that. Um, I love it. So. We're getting close to the end of our time, and I want to uh, have you all answer one of the audience's key interest areas, and that is what's coming in the future. Um, what can we expect maybe in the short term and the long term? And Ryan, because this is not your area, you know, you're, you're actually one of the people who's implementing it. I'd just like to hear from you to kick it off on what, what is your own organization expecting to do in the future around this? What's your kind of phase two, phase three look like? Yeah, it, moving more from business intelligence and you know the standard reporting and analytics that we're doing today, really to more advanced analytics. You know, we're investing quite heavily now in AI, ML, and we have been getting to that point over the last couple of years, and we've been on this POC treadmill where we'll identify uh, something valuable that we can predict and we, we conduct the POC on a single line or with a single customer in a single location. And we get that's the as far as we get because we don't have the ability to scale that out. The data infrastructure isn't there to support it to be able to go to the next site and the next site and the standardization around that data doesn't support so it's, it's almost like a new project to go even to the next site or the next line to be able to scale that out. So getting to a more predictive cognitive environment where we're spending less time on the non-value added activities and we can reduce a lot of the waste in the process, leveraging the data that we have is, is where we see a lot of the value coming from our data in the future. That's great. And I mean, that's definitely something I'm sure a lot of people are sitting out there thinking, yeah, I really want that too. So I think that's fantastic. Well, good luck with that. We wish you the best in, in getting there. It sounds exciting. Um, Dimitri, 
What do you see? You know, you're a super duper technologist and you've worked with lots and lots of companies. What do you what do you see as the future in this area? What's coming next and maybe what's coming in the way future in your mind? Um, so um, uh, there are um, uh, like uh, the evaluation of um, uh, customer platform developments and how business works with the data uh, follows the direction when a company would like to uh, gather the data for further analysis. Uh, once uh, they are managing the data, they would like to um, find actionable insights from the data, uh, build uh, sophisticated uh, AI models um, on top of the data, um, identify user behavior, um, build better recommendations for the business. So next step, once um, company has built um, the data platform uh, with the self-service capabilities will be to um, start introducing ML practice, start um, experimenting with the data and um, create it's a kind of ROI based model of implementing, um, of introducing AI capabilities into the business. So this is how we see our customers are driving um, their business, starting from um, tiny platform in the cloud and now having sophisticated ML platforms, um, which deliver uh, much value to the business. That's great. That sounds great. I love that. Um, thank you for sharing that. And Krithika, we're going to turn to you for the final word here on the future. So what have you got up your sleeve at AWS and yeah. what are you all thinking about the future? Yeah. So, so certainly. So I know on the earlier poll, you know, we had where customers were still thinking, I mean, some of our guests were thinking about cloud migration. So we think that the acceleration to cloud, um, we expect we, we expect to see that and we think there's a huge opportunity ahead of us and we're excited about that. Uh, because when we go have talk to customers, it's not why cloud, but it's always like, how do we get started? Because they understand the value. And once they start doing that, it always becomes, you know, you know we heard from the other panelists, Ryan and Dimitri, about machine learning being, being part of the next evolution of once you have the data platform. Certainly, I think there's just going to be a lot of workloads in going into machine learning and personalization, improving customer engagement. And then the way to do all that is, you know, retailers are trying, they're investing, reskilling their employees, but they're also looking for um, ways by which, you know, we can make machine learning uh, much more seamless for people, even who don't have machine learning skills. And I think uh, that paradigm and that shift is happening where they're looking at uh, the cloud providers to provide them with services where they can actually democratize machine learning across all the different use cases and not just tie it to like one specific Oh, can I just do recommendation engine? Can I just do forecasting? No, but can I apply machine learning in every aspect of my operation, be it customer engagement and be it operational, right? How do I get that going? Um, so yeah, and then of course we have reInvent uh, starting November 29th. So be on the lookout and we're gonna have a lot more, lot more new services and new features and existing services being launched. Oh, that's great. That's gonna be exciting. Looking forward to that for sure. Well, I want to say that we are actually running out of time right now, sadly, but that went so fast for me. And I really hope it went very quickly and was really engaging and interesting for you, our audience. I want to thank our panelists. Really, thank you guys so much for everything you've done here today and everything you've shared. It's great to have such expertise in one single place, and we really appreciate your time. And I also want to thank our amazing audience. Thank you all for taking time out today and joining us. We really appreciate it. And um, we look forward to seeing you on future podcasts. We'll also send out a recording of this podcast that you can look at and refer to, or perhaps share with a coworker. Thank you all so much. And we sure hope to see you back soon. Have a great day, everybody.